And we're back. Uh, welcome back and happy Thursday. Uh, today we're going to switch gears, uh, but before we do that, uh, some administrative bits. The reading uh, is the first 48 pages from the FLAC uh, machine learning text, uh, chapter one primarily. And also homework one is due on the 2nd of September. That's one uh, second before midnight. That's 11.59 and 59 seconds uh, p.m. Where we last left off, we talked about the anatomy of a learner. And we said there were some components uh, that were not under your control, namely the unknown target function uh, that's responsible for providing all the ground truth labels. Uh, we have a set of training examples, which are the labels assigned by that unknown target function to a number of training examples whose feature values are given to you or governed by a probability distribution. We also have some components, uh, these three that I've highlighted, uh, that are under your control. These are the hypothesis uh, set, which is a kind of educated guess about a set or family of candidate formulas that you believe uh, could mimic uh, the unknown target function. There's a learning algorithm whose job it is to search through the space of hypotheses for some hypothesis among that hypothesis set uh, that best or most coincides with the unknown target function as measured by some error metric. That learning algorithm searches and results in a final best hypothesis that we're calling uh, G. And so we also talked about a pipeline uh, for the end-to-end -end pattern recognition system. We have input patterns that feed into a sensor, followed by feature generation, feature selection, classifier design, and ultimately system evaluation. So today we're gonna focus on the sensor, and just as a refresher, a sensor is the apparatus uh, from which uh, your basic information arrives. It can be a physical device like uh, a video camera or a thermometer, or it can be a logical device like maybe a piece of software that detects uh, the network packets that are coming in uh, to a server, for example. So throughout life, the visual sensory mode is very, very important regardless uh, of if it's an infancy uh, young adulthood, or even into old age. Uh, human beings very much so rely on our visual system. In fact, it's been said that 90% of all of the information transmitted into our brains is visual. 70% of your sensory receptors in your body are in your eyes. 50% uh, of your brain is active when you're doing visual processing and 40% of people respond better when you present them with visual information. So it means that the visual sensory mode is very, very important uh, to us. So let's take a look at what happens in the visual system uh, for the mammalian and human visual system. Uh, it captures light from the environment. It goes in through the lens of your eyes, uh, through uh, the pupil, and it comes into contact this uh, light with a set of cells on the back of your eye, uh, namely the retina. And these, this retina has a dense set of sensory apparatus, uh, namely rods and cones. And these cones are very densely packed with one another in the central region in the back of your eye called the fovea. And then as you go outward from the fovea, foveal region, along the periphery of your eye, uh, these sensory receptors, these cones, are less densely uh, populated. And so when we look at your field of view, the foveal region tends to be that region in your visual field associated with the highest quality, most crisp, most well-defined, the high def, if you will, region of your vision. And that just happens to correspond to the region on the back of your eyeball, the retina, uh, that has the densest number of cones. The more dense your sensory apparatus, the better set of measurements and the more clear picture you're going to have. So the foveal region of your field of view corresponds to about a two-degree cone of field of view. So it's relatively very small. 
And as you go further out to a 10-degree cone, that's called your parafocal. 60-degree cone is called your near peripheral. And then your peripheral vision covers uh, 180 degrees. Now, as you go further and further away from foveal to parafoveal to near peripheral to peripheral, your visual acuity gets worse and worse. So this is the depiction of what your sight looks like as you go from the foveal region in the center to parafoveal all the way out ultimately to your peripheral vision. In fact, you could try an experiment and if you look forward and you don't look to the side and somebody holds up an object, you know something's there and maybe you know it's moving, but you don't, can't tell what shape that is, for example. But as you bring it closer and closer and closer, get to your parafoveal vision, ah, you can tell what color it is and more features become very apparent. And that's due in, uh, to the more dense uh, arrangement of cones, those sensory, visual sensory receptors in the back of your eye in the foveal region. And so one of the interesting things that happens uh, is in infancy, we're preconditioned with a reflex called the tonic neck reflex. And this is something that you have at birth, and you can actually do this as a newborn uh, or an infant. Uh, you pick up the newborn, the infant, you turn its head gently, and the key is gently and slowly, uh, to one side. And when you do that, that arm pops up. So if you turn it to the left side, the left arm pops up in the air. And if you turn it to the right side, the right hand pops up in the air. And it sort of makes sense if you look at it, and that's the tonic neck reflex. Uh, if you cast a line from the eyes to the hand, it's a direct line of sight from the foveal region to the arm. And that kind of makes sense in terms of human development, because when a child starts to crawl, they grab a lot of things. And things that are in arm's reach are in available for description in the most high definition fashion possible. And so what that's really doing, this tonic neck reflex, is conditioning the infant to gather high resolution, very good descriptive uh, features, if you will, of the environment around it that it can manipulate as it builds concepts that describe objects in the world around it. Now, of course, this tonic neck reflex looks very familiar to something you've seen before. Um, and you notice how the hand that you use to grasp objects is perfectly aligned with your foveal vision. Now, this looks very similar to something that we've seen before. Uh, it looks like track star Usain Bolt. So Usain Bolt is doing the tonic neck reflex. All right. Well, it seemed funny when I was making the slides. Anyways, uh, so let's continue on. And this is a more enlarged cutaway view of the anatomy of the eye, you have rays of light that are reflecting off of objects in the world. And these rays of light are collected, uh, refracted or bent through the lens to make their way through the pupil in to the back of the eye. And this image uh, is inverted and comes to rest on uh, this light energy on the retina. Now the cones encode this or respond to the receptive fields, these cones respond to various frequencies of light and send signals through the retinal cord uh, to your brain uh, for processing. So if we look at this anatomy of an eye, well, what do we do in computer vision? Uh, we have a camera that abstracts what happens uh, in the human eye. And so this model uses the so-called pinhole camera. And if you think about it, the pinhole camera looks a lot like an eye. Instead of a pupil, uh, you have a pinhole, and you have light from an object reflecting, and they make its way through the pinhole, and these rays cross and come to rest on the so-called image plane. The image plane is kind of like a retina. So we have these rays of light that are collected uh, through the pinhole. Now, this pinhole camera was actually a pinhole. It's not a theoretical concept. These are early uh, cameras from the late 1800s. Now, they literally had a piece of paper or foil, and you literally put a pinhole in it, and it had some plates that were coated with photosensitive materials, the photographic plates, and you would put a black tarp around this part, and you'd look to see where it's pointing, and then you'd remove a cork, exposing, collecting that light, and it would react with this uh, photo, uh, sensitive 
material on the plate, then you'd close the plate and put it in a dark container and then go and develop it and there are your photographs. You can act, this is another view of the pinhole camera. The photographic plates would slide into these chambers and you'd have a black cloth that blocked out all the light underneath and then you'd see where it's going, look at the image, make sure it's right and you let the light get collected, expose the photographic plate and then cover it up immediately, keep it in the dark area and then take it back to be uh, developed uh, and printed out for your photographs. So this is an old pinhole camera. You can actually buy pinhole cameras on Amazon, and this one's on Amazon, and it's something experiment for kids, uh, and you can actually uh, develop film and take pictures using pinhole cameras. Fun stuff. And so we take this pinhole camera concept and we add in a lens. We have a lens here in the center uh, after the object, and that lens's responsibility is to bend or refract light. So it collects and focuses more light, uh, and that light then, instead of having a retina, it comes to rest on a CCD, a charged, couple, a charged coupled display, or a complementary metal ox, oxide semiconductor, or CMOS, imaging element. So this, these rays of light excite the CCD sensor, and then we take those uh, voltages uh, from the excited CCD sensor, CMOS or CMOS sensor, and we digitize it to one of a number of levels, representing a pixel array or, uh, in two dimensions, where each uh, cell in this pixel array takes on a digitized value corresponding to a color derived from that frequency of light that excited uh, the CCD sensor. And so this apparatus altogether is a digital camera. And in fact, there are variations of it, but for the most part, it mimics uh, what happens in the human eye with some interesting optics uh, lenses uh, to shape uh, the light sources that enter into the sensor. And so in this image, uh, we depict uh, some important measurements that impact uh, what you see uh, in an image. Now here we have what's called the optical axis. The optical axis pierces uh, the focal plane where it comes to a point uh, in what's called what looks like the fovea, the foveal region. So this optical axis defines uh, the origin, if you will, of the foveal region. And then we also have a coordinate system in X and Y uh, that describes the displacement from that foveal region in the optical center, uh, that displacement along the horizontal uh, direction and the vertical direction. And so then we have what's called the image plane. This image plane is where uh, that uh, projection, if you will, uh, all that light collected, the image of the item, uh, where it displays. Now certainly, there's a difference between the optical focus center, focal length, where it comes to a point, uh, and this image plane, that's called the focal length. Now, if you change the focal length, you can either lengthen it or you can make it smaller. What happens when you lengthen it? Well, when you lengthen it, you're essentially zooming the picture gets bigger. When you make it smaller, um, you're, this picture uh, gets smaller. You're collecting uh, a wider from a wider field of view and the picture gets smaller. Let's take a look uh, at an example. Here we have a small focal length, so that means we're bringing the image plane closer to the focal plane. And if we do that, well, these two planes get closer and closer together. So what happens? Well, uh, that image plane, that ray of light, they come closer and closer to that focus. And so that image, if we slide this backwards, make that focal length smaller, we get a smaller view of that image. Uh, we're actually collecting more light, that cone is much further, and so what we see when we image it on that CMOS and digitizer is we see a smaller version. So we're being more wide angle on the view of our picture. Now, when we increase the focal length, we're more telephoto, right? We're bringing it closer to the image, and we get a zoomed version, a bigger version, because that cone of light is more narrow uh, that strikes uh, the image plane. So here we have a photograph, and these uh, quantities, uh, 18 millimeter through 300 millimeter, that's the focal length, the distance between the image plane and the focal plane. And at 18 millimeters, we see a very uh, wide angle view. We increase it, we notice that uh, a lot of regions of interest in the image uh, disappear and we see uh, these houses uh, more closely. And then we go further and you'll notice this tree is getting bigger as well as the houses. 
at 55 at 85 the tree is getting bigger and you see uh, only a few of the houses you no longer see that fence at 24 millimeters at 105 you see more of the house 135 200 and at 33 this largest focal length among all of them you see that house quite well you don't see any of the other houses and before you never saw the fence around the house but now you can clearly see that fencing uh, around the house and so oftentimes uh, we take a lens and that lens refracts or bends uh, the rays of light that come in uh, to try to change the focal point uh, of uh, these beams that come in uh, to our imaging apparatus. Now, certainly on many modern cameras, this lens is put uh, inside of a housing, and that housing is threaded, so you can turn it and use it to move the lens forward or backwards to more dramatically change the focal length. And you can do all sorts of interesting things uh, with this. And so if you have a short focal length here, we have an object, and we have the back focal length and the front focal length, and we have these parallel rays uh, from the image, and we have this ray, main ray, coming down in through the lens, gets refracted, uh, these uh, to the focal point and then it inverts and here's our image height. So we can use lenses to shape the image in all sorts of ways, um, including rotating the image uh, and all sorts of interesting things uh, beyond the scope of this particular class. So this is a cutaway view of a modern SLR, single lens reflex camera, and we have a lot of lenses and mirrors here. It's a literal optical system. And the interesting part about this is a mirror that implements a splitter, and you can actually literally see uh, a split version of that image that comes to rest on the CCD, on the back plane, uh, that you use to digitize and capture uh, that image. So this is an actual single lens reflex, a modern 35 millimeter camera. And so here, uh, this is an abstraction of that. Here we have two uh, image planes. We have the front principal plane and the rear principal plane. We have a lens, and based on the properties of that lens, it bends and shapes that image such that when you turn the lens uh, and it's threaded, uh, you can change the back focal length as well as the working distance, but more so it's the back focal length you're concerned about uh, to manipulate the size of image and the field of view, the angle for the field of view. And so you'll notice here, uh, the angle for the field of view over two is here, and this is the field of view. So by changing the focal length, you can either capture a wider cone of light uh, for wide angle or a narrow cone zoomed in uh, for telephoto. Okay, so the problem with this type of sensing uh, vision is that an image is really a two-dimensional snapshot of a three-dimensional world. So in this example, we have a cube in three dimensions, and these rays are the points of light that we get uh, from the edges, from the corners of these cubes. And when we look at the cube projected on some canvas, we get two concentric rectangles, one for the front planar face and one for the back planar face. And so the problem in this image, you also see these edges as slanted lines. And so on your canvas, what you see is the following image. Now, of course, in your mind, slides keep changing, of course, in your mind, you have to imagine uh, the projective distortion that happens uh, for these vanishing lines uh, and kind of in your mind construct the cube. But the real problem is that here we have a three-dimensional object and we're taking a 2D projection. So you get this so-called projective distortion. And so one of the important questions is how you recover ground truth uh, about the object in the 3D world, given that you have a projective distortion uh, through your two-dimensional snapshot of it. And so another example here, this is our imaging plane and you're viewing uh, some object, some shape, that's on another plane, and based on the relative orientation between that object and the imaging plane, you're going to get a projective distortion. So here we have a right triangle, and now in our projective distortion, uh, that right angle is no longer a right angle. It's a little bit larger uh, than a right angle. Okay. So let's take a look, now that we've seen a little bit about uh, image formation, 
how the light makes its way to the sensing device, let's look at the representation uh, that the sensor gives us. And this is something called a color space. Now, the RGB, or red, green, blue color space, is represented as a so-called color cube. And this cube defines a red axis, a green axis, and a blue axis. And each coordinate axis describes the amount of saturation or the amount of each principal color such that when you mix them together, that mixture forms some color. And so here, each position in this cube represents a color resulting from mixing red, green, and blue. Now, of course, if you have equal representation of red, green, and blue, you get some shade of gray. So we draw this diagonal from origin to the extreme and that represents equal mixtures of red, green, and blue. It's the grayscale line. And so every color in RGB uh, color space representation corresponds to a grayscale if you have equal mixture representation, equal saturation uh, of red, green, and blue. Other colors that are not on the gray line are a, a, a component of uh, red, green, or a, a, an actual color that's not gray. Now, of course, uh, you can go into a browser and we can try this uh, actually in HTML. You can go into a browser and actually um, code up a background uh, that will give you a different color as a mixture of red, uh, green, and blue. And so here we have a simple HTML file, right? So I'm going to actually bring up my browser. And in that browser, I'm going to first write uh, a, an HTML file. And in that HTML file, uh, I'm going to put it here in my home directory, and I'm going to call it test.html, test.html. Now, test.html, I have already had it prepared, and test.html is just going to define a basic web page. It's going to set a background color, and I'm going to set the amount of red, green, and blue uh, that's going to be in my background color. So if I say FF, that's in hexadecimal, so that's 255 parts red, 0, 0, 0 parts uh, green, 0 parts blue. So it's going to be a red web page, and it's going to have that following text. So let me save that, and I will bring up my browser here, and I will file open on that web page. So open file, and I'm going to go to my home directory, and I'm going to uh, open test test.html. There we go, test.html. So I open that, and this is what I get. I get a bright red, full saturation red uh, web page. So now let me try changing that uh, HTML file. I'm going to change it to have, let's see, um, F0 is the amount of red. So if I change the saturation uh, to be F0 instead of FF, let's see what that gives us. So I run that some more. Okay, that's a little bit too much. So let me call it um, uh, 1, 0, right? So I've reduced it dramatically, the saturation of the red. Let's see what happens here. Uh, it looks black. It's not that much. So let me call it. Um, uh, eight zero in hexadecimal. Okay, so let's try that. Let's see what happens. There we go. It's not as much as saturation for red. So let me add in eight zero green and eight zero blue, and let's see what happens there. So this is a mixture equal for red, green, and blue. So it should be a shade of gray. And yes, it is a shade of gray. Uh, so we've tinkered with the red, so let's just turn off the red, zero parts red, uh, let's say F, F parts green, and let's say zero parts uh, blue. So this should be green. So if we load that, let's see, that's green. It's a pretty uh, bright, obnoxious green. So let's say zero, zero, and let's have full blue there, and let's see what happens. It should be a very bright uh, blue, and there's our blue. So what happens if we mix 8, 0 uh, on the blue with 8, 0 uh, on the green? 
uh, and we'll see what happens when we mix that halfway blue with that halfway green. Let's see what we get. My daughter knows the color. Well, yeah, we're mixing blue with green. You can see some of that green. Let's say we mix um, zero um, F of red with that green and blue. So we're going to add in some of that red to that green and blue. Uh, let's see what we get. Oh, let's save that. Uh, and let's see what we get. No, we didn't get that much. Uh, so let's uh, turn that up a little bit. Instead of F0, uh, we're going to say uh, 4 uh, 0, right? So we have some red, but not as much red as the green and blue, right? So it starts to get more and more gray. So let's turn down uh, some of that blue here, and let's see what happens. Uh, so we have a lot of green, and so we get something that's kind of a purple. And so here uh, we are demonstrating uh, what that mixture uh, can do for you uh, and showing you in real time uh, what this RGB color space uh, means. And so uh, please do try this and tinker with it yourself. So what is an image? We said it's a pixel array, and a pixel array in three dimensions. We have uh, M by N pic pixels in the image. Uh, the red component, the green component, and the blue component are so-called color channels. And the color channel for the red represents the amount of red from zero, meaning no red, to 255, or FF hexadecimal, for full red. And so you can imagine uh, this M by N as having three slices, the top slice the so-called red plane or the red color channel represents the amount of red. Uh, the middle plane uh, represents the amount of green for each pixel location and image. Uh, and the last plane represents the amount of blue uh, for each pixel in the image. Uh, so let's experiment with this in MATLAB. So I will exit uh, the PowerPoint. And we're going to look at an image here. Uh, and I'm just going to try um, a little script. So let's say new script. And in that new script, I'm going to save it, and I'm just going to call it the name uh, test uh, color space. Okay, so test color space is what I will call this. Let me maximize that. And let's look at this dog, uh, this image called a dog's life. So I image name equals uh, a dog's life dot jpg. It's a JPEG file. And so I'm going to read this image, I equals I am read image name. And the one thing I like to do is to say display done at the end uh, so that I can have a statement on which I can uh, set a breakpoint. So let me set that breakpoint. I'm going to run this. And if we look at this image, I'm going to show you the dimensions. It's 523 uh, rows uh, by 800. It's 523 columns by 800 rows, so 523 by 800, uh, and it's a U unsigned 8-bit integer. So that means we have 523 by 800 pixels, and then that first, uh, first plane, which is that last dimension, you notice it's three, one dimension for red, one plane for red, one plane for green, one plane for blue. So let's say we say uh, rows, uh, let's say columns, rows, uh, actually, let's display it. I am show image, right? So let's quit and save. Let's run this. And so to see this image, it's a dog's life. Well, let's see. Uh, the number of uh, rows, the number of columns, right? So it has more rows, 500 some odd rows. We have, we have, let's see if I can get that. 523 rows, 800 columns. Uh, and we have the red, green, and blue color channel. So let's actually measure this uh, in MATLAB. Uh, so let's say uh, the number of rows, number of columns, and the, and the uh, depth. The depth is the uh, third dimension. It's going to be three. So we say is equal to size of image I. Okay. So now we have this image and we can certainly display it. Let's remove uh, the green and the blue and just show the red. Okay, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to create uh, a, we're going to set all of the rows and columns for the first channel. Let's say red channel. We're going to keep those. So, gonna, so that's going to be the first one. 
the first channel. Um, green, green channel. We're going to set that to two. And blue channel. We're going to set that uh, to three. So now we have red channel, green channel, blue channel. So now I'm going to say, all right, well, I want to make a copy of this image. So I, the red version, is going to equal zeros, uh, rows by calls, by depth, okay? So I'm going to store it, and I'm going to say I, red, is equal to I. And I'm going to set zeros, and the type I'm going to use is U int 8, 8-bit unsized integer. So it'll go 8 bits, goes from 0 to 255. I'm going to say I, G for green, zeros, rows, calls, depth, U int unsigned integer, 8-bit. And then I'm going to say uh, blue version of the image, zeros, rows, columns, depth, U int 8. Okay. So now I'm going to initialize IR to I, initialize IG to I, initialize IB uh, to I. Okay. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to take IR and it's going to be equal to um, IR and I'm going to set all the rows and all the columns for the green channel, I'm going to set all those to equal zero. So I'm going to null them out. And then likewise, I'm also, let's see, what happened here? I have a bug. Let's see. Oh, oh, I didn't need to do that. So uh, it's equal to zero. There we go. So I'm going to zero out the green channel on IR, and I'm going to zero out the blue channel on IR, leaving the red channel. So all rows, all columns, um, blue channel equals zero. Okay. So likewise, on IG, I'm going to zero out the red channel and the blue channel. So I'm going to say IG, IG, I'm going to zero out the red channel, and I'm going to zero out the blue channel. And then lastly, for IB, I'm going to zero out the red and the green channel. So I'm going to zero out the red channel and the green channel, green channel. Okay, so now... I display the original image. Uh, let me call that figure one. I'm going to display the original image. And then in figure two, I'm going to display the red image, IR. In figure three, I'm going to display uh, IG, the green image. And likewise, in figure four, I'm going to display the blue image. I am show IB. So what I've done here is I've taken the image, and then I've made a copy of it three times. In the first copy, uh, I zero out uh, all channels but the red. And then I zero out all channels but the green. and zero out all channels but the blue. And then I show those results. So what I'm going to get is a red, green, and blue version, those components of the original image. Okay, so let's run this. And what you can see is we see the original image in figure one. We have the red version here in figure two, the red version. We have the green version and we also have the blue version. Now, certainly, if I scaled up or scaled down or used different mixtures, um, I could do all sorts of things with the color for this image, but this is just to show you what the different color channels are. Okay. Now, certainly, if I wanted to 
plot this in gray, remember we said gray is nothing more than equal parts red, equal parts blue, equal parts green. So then what we can do is take the original image, we can call it an M by N by one matrix, and then each of those gray values is just gonna be the equal mixture of red, green, and blue. So let's try this out. IG for gray is equal to zeros, rows, columns, by one, it's a U int eight. Okay, so now that we have this, we're gonna now set IG, its rows and its columns, one, are gonna be set to the rows and columns, of I, rows, columns, uh, red, channel. We're going to take one third of this, 0 0.33 times I red, plus the rows and columns of the green channel. So we're going to take 0 0.33, let me copy and paste here, of green channel values and we're going to add to that dot 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 and 0 0.33 of the blue channel blue channel okay so now we take that gray image which is m by n by one and we're going to display this gray image i figure Five, and we're going to do an IM show to show IG, which is the grayscale image. And this is just to prove to you uh, that the equal contribution, that dotted gray line, uh, the diagonal in the RGB color cube is the grayscale line. So there's the red, green, blue, and there's the grayscale image, right? Uh, you get the grayscale by equal mixture of the red component, the green component, component and the blue component. And here we have a perfectly formed uh, grayscale image. Okay, uh, so with that, uh, let me switch back to the PowerPoint. Let me bring down uh, some of this MATLAB and I will switch back to PowerPoint and we continue uh, our discussion. Okay, so let me minimize this. And here's our PowerPoint, maximize. Uh, so let's continue. All right, so let's take a look at a handful of interesting computer vision issues. Look at the following image, and I'm only gonna display it for a few seconds, and we'll talk about it. Okay, what did you look at first? Did you look at bananas? Did you look at peaches, apples? Did you see the person in there? What did you look at second? Was there a sign? How much? were the apples. Hmm, what was the third thing you looked at? Okay, so let's look at the picture again. Yes, there are people in there. Uh, the apples were over here, it looks like, and they look like they're 75 uh, euro cents each. It looks like 79 cents each. Uh, there are bananas, there are pineapples. Uh, there's a lot of shiny metal in here. Uh, there's some pre-cut fruit, looks pretty good. Oh, some papaya. I love papaya. Anyways, so when you looked at it, your eye went from one item to the next, to the next, to the next, trying to make understanding of all of the features that were there in the environment. And so there's a device that can track how your eye shifts or saccades among different features in an environment when you're trying to put together in your mind a description of that environment. Now, this is called an eye tracking system. It records those eye shifts or saccades. And this young woman here is wearing uh, this eye tracking system. It has some backwards facing cameras to actually look where your eyes are saccading. And you can actually project and actually literally measure where on an image or some screen uh, you're looking. And this is immensely useful for a number of applications. So here's an image. And this image lists all the saccades that someone makes when they try to make sense of the image. So they start here, they shift here, 
they shift down, they do a bunch of saccades in here to try to uncover detail about this object, and then they shift over here to try to uncover detail about this object. Then they shift here to the bookcase, and shift here to try saccade a few times here to try to uh, understand this. Shift here, saccade around a few times, here's a person, saccade around a few times to gather detail. And one of the interesting things is that you shift from one object to the next, and then you interrogate that object by saccading a few times to try to uncover details, the relationship among various features uh, within the image. Okay, so this eye tracker is also used in other uh, uh, examples in retail. So this is the entryway uh, to a Best Buy store, electronic store, and they put on eye trackers on human subjects and have them go into the store and they record all the places uh, where this person saccades, where they look. Now, of course, uh, they measure those counts of all the places where they saccade and measure the amount of time they saccade and draw in a heat map to represent those places they more frequently look at in this image. And so what the interesting part is, when they design the store and where to place products, the more valuable parts of the store are those places where people look the most. And so you notice prominently up above are these signs with high contrast that tell you where things are. And then the products that they want to pitch the most, typically the cell phones, they're very high profit, they put right smack dab in the center at all the hot spots. TVs are a big seller. So off on the right, they have the TV section uh, and the Best Buy. So this product placement uh, can be determined in a data-driven fashion using eye trackers by uh, depicting histograms of the location as well as the time and the frequency by which you saccade and you plot this heat map where blue represents uh, fewer saccades and red, the hottest part, hence the name heat map, represents the most frequent saccades. And so it's also used in packaging in the retail area. You get a product like some meat here and you have somebody look at this product uh, wearing an eye tracker and you record a heat map based on where they saccade. And so here in this particular case, you see that the first place they look uh, is at the actual item. You look at the beef in this case, because you know, oh, wow, is this beef something that I want to buy and something I want to eat? Then the next thing they do is they saccade to and spend a lot of time looking at the tag. What is this item? Uh, when is the packing date? Uh, what type it is, what's the price, and so forth. And then the third thing they do is they look down here to find out a little bit more, maybe it's a cooking idea, uh, the sticker. And in particular, this sticker was noticed after 1.8 seconds. The first thing they noticed right away was the meat, and the label, uh, they saccaded that and noticed that after uh, 0.6 seconds. And so you can actually take advantage of this and design your packaging. You'll notice the most prominent area in this packaging, there's a lot of real estate in this packaging devoted to showing you what the meat looks like with the product itself. And then second, this label, it's kind of smaller than the area for the meat, and then this other label, it's even smaller. So they kind of shift the second and third choice off to the side and make them smaller to make the meat the star of this particular uh, picture. Okay, and so this is another use of saccade. Let me ask you another question. Which one of these is not like the other? Hmm. There are lots of different ways that you can depict not like the other. Some fishes are in the opposite direction. Some fishes are bigger or some fish are smaller. Some are different colors. Some are different sizes. Some are different shapes. And so how you represent uh, differences uh, can be a vi an important visual cue uh, for describing a scene. Another thing we're concerned about is when things move. Uh, here's a stick figure, and let's say you're moving and you're taking a frame, a camera, of somebody who's moving. At time T0, the person looks like this. At time T1, the person looks like this. They've moved a little bit. Let me superimpose them and shift between them so you can actually see that motion. T0, T1, T0, T1, T0, T1. So one of the things you're concerned about when you're trying to track motion you want to know where those pixels went in the image from time zero to time one. So literally you say, did this thing, I know it moved between time zero and time one, 
um, where can I find this particular feature in that picture? And I know it has moved somewhere else from where it originally was, plus or minus some delta. And so let's superimpose the two. You can see how it's moved. Uh, this is the so-called correspondence problem in computer vision. And the naive assumption is that you have two cameras and that most scene points uh, in your image are viewable in both images. And the corresponding patches, i.e. the legs, are very similar from each instant to the next. And so this requires you to know the distance of the points from the camera, how far the camera is, uh, and the distance of points from the camera is typically much larger than the distance between cameras. And so it's the same problem if you have two cameras apart from one another some distance, or if you have one camera and that camera's moving, or if the person is moving. And so the procedure is you take one image, and then you take the next image, and you search for the corresponding regions or patch of the first picture in the other image. Now, this can give you a potentially large sp search space, a large number of regions in the new image at time t1 where you have to search. And you can use constraints to reduce the amount of time and space that you have to search. And so now you need uh, some sort of similarity measure in order to find where does this part of the first image occur in the second image. And so you can literally use correlation to do this, statistical correlation, and there's the formula. I won't go over that. I'll leave it up to you to look it up. Uh, and we can do this in the following example. So you take an image at time t0, and in this case, the camera has moved. The camera has moved to the right. And you know that distance the camera has moved, and that's our distance to the camera. So you take your original image, uh, you move the camera, and then you take another image at time t1. Now, one of the questions that you might want to ask, did this doorway at time T0, at time T0 here in the, the red uh, box, um, where did it move in uh, this image from time T0 to time T1? So in time T1, hmm, there are a bunch of candidates you might think are that doorway. Well, we know from looking at it, it's here in the center, but it could be here, it could be here, it could have moved there, it could have moved there. So how do you do this computationally? Well, you take your original patch of image, and then you have a bunch of candidates uh, regions in the new image, and you literally search. You compare. See, does this correlate to that? What's the correlation between these two? What's the correlation between the red and this one and this one? And whichever one returns the highest correlation score, that's the best match, okay, because they're the most similar in their appearance. And now this correlation is computed between the gray level pixel values between this F and all the possible candidates uh, for G, the patches of image in the new image at time T1. Okay, so why is this, this, this is called the correspondence problem. And you can use correlation uh, to, to solve the correspondence problem, the finding of content from one image in a new version of that image. Now, why is that even a thing? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, here we have two cameras, and these cameras are viewing the same scene uh, from different locations. And you know ground truth, the baseline distance between these two cameras. Well, you can use trigonometry to determine through triangulation the distance from, of the ball from each one uh, of the, from that baseline between the two cameras. Uh, what do you do with triangulation? If you can determine this distance, now you can, read this, you can uh, recover what's called the depth the distance of the ball, and literally use that triangulated distance to reconstruct the third dimension of the ball. So you can start with two images, uh, the left and the right, and use this computation, this triangulation, and actually come up with a three-dimensional representation of the ball, and you can do that uh, quite, uh, quite accurately. Okay, so we take this correlation, and instead of just having two cameras, we have a number of cameras, around an area. It could be one camera that moves, or we could have multiple cameras. And in doing so, from these different viewpoints between the two different adjacent cameras next to one another, you can recover and calculate a very rich three-dimensional model of an object. And in fact, they do this very thing uh, in sports arenas. So let me play uh, a video, and it's going to discuss uh, the football games that do exactly this. around the stadium to really 
really eliminate how a play happened, why it happened. You're able to play it back and get this matrix kind of look. Treat the scene behind the quarterback and go all the way around the secondary and see how everybody sees one scene one moment. Serious game time here for Johnson Stewart. It really is. Good blocking up front. To create this effect, the iVision 360 team relies on 36 5K cameras, all of which then video by a fiber optics back to the bank of service. Once captured, an algorithm is stitched with the moving images together, creating a view of the lady shot from any angle by a virtual camera. We actually are creating a new video format. All the information that's being captured. So let me just um, stress that the word stitching uh, means solving the correspondence problem. What pixel in one image corresponds to pixel in another? And when you do that, uh, you can actually put those images together as if they were a single image. Let me draw you a very quick diagram of that. Let me set the pen color. I'll set that to black. So let's say you have two images and one image has the object here like this and let's say the other camera has the object because it's in a different location the object looks like this and so if you know that this hand corresponds to this hand you solve the correspondence problem and in effect you can take that first image let's call that image a and let's call it image b and you can literally superimpose them as if they were a single image. So here, this is the stick figure, and this is image A, and here's that left arm, and then image uh, B would look like this. Let me see if I can superimpose it. Image B would look like this you can now align these two images because you know this point is the same thing from this perspective and from that perspective. You can do that in addition, and what does that give you? It gives you the ability to drive around in the image and get a big view. So if you have enough cameras, you can stitch together enough images that give you a 360 degree view of the field with all the players in it. And now you're just driving around in this image, wrapping yourself around all the players, in addition to reconstructing the three-dimensional information. Okay, so let's go back to the video and continue. So you see the volume. Higher resolution. So when you render the scene out, you're actually able to zoom in, zoom out, go a little bit higher, go a little bit lower. It's a really, really cool effect. Creating this 360 effect is one engineer error, but getting iVision 360 to work within the time constraints of a live Super Bowl broadcast presented its own set of challenges. Because there are 36 cameras, it's picking the right three or four that make the sequence make sense and doing that quickly because obviously time is always of the essence if you want to get a play on the air. We push our servers for a limit. We do calibration tests. All of these processes take time, so working through each and every little component until you have a consistent solid system is ideal for any live production. Here's another example of using this 3D stitching and correspondence.
Okay, so let's continue on. Another uh, example of a correspondence problem using things like correlation is so-called optic flow. Now, if you've ever driven during a snowstorm, you notice how that illusion of the, of the snowflakes kind of spreading out as they come towards your car. That's exactly optic flow. And what you do in optic flow as you're driving, you take a picture, and then some short time afterward, take another picture, and then you're computing for each patch of image, where did it go from the first instant to the next? And you're plotting a vector representing that motion. That's called the optic flow field. And you can use optic flow field to do all sorts of things like detect obstacles, because things that are closer to you, oh, well, those vectors are gonna be of larger magnitude. Things that are further away from you, those vectors are gonna be of shorter magnitude. So if you take a flow field and you're driving along, say an autonomous vehicle, uh, you want to veer around obstacles, i.e. those regions of the field of view associated with a higher um, magnitude for the vectors in the flow field in various regions of the imaged area. So this is optic flow, and this is an example of an optic flow field uh, that someone has demonstrated. So you see, as this person passes the book, uh, past the field of view of the camera, you can see the flow field calculated real time. There's some spurious artifacts, uh, but it does quite a good job. Okay, so let's see that one more time. Here's the flow field. And you can see the flow fields are aligned with this, it looks like a cactus and some of the uh, text here. So this is optic flow. Uh, and uh, this is a summary of a handful of computer vision issues. But what I really want to highlight uh, is the sensor part, uh, particularly the pinhole model for the camera and what it means to capture an image and how an image is represented. So we will follow up uh, with features uh, generation that you can do from images. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll end here. And just a reminder to make sure you're keeping up with the reading and homework one is due on the 2nd of September at 11.59 and 59 seconds. Uh, so with that, that's all I had to say. Um, I will see you on Tuesday. Have a great weekend. Uh, see you Tuesday. And as always, please stay healthy and stay safe.